And um, good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us. Uh, I'm excited to be here today with James, uh, James Sims, Dr. James Sims, um, part of the Physio U team. He is instrumental in actually the development of many of the apps, as well as almost every single e-learning module, uh, simulation, um, interactive learning quizzes, they all run by James. James is unique in that he's been teaching. James, how many years in entry level? For uh, 26 years in 20 PT, years. PTA and I yeah. mean, healthcare or a physician, OT, OMP, so very broad. So broad, very broad strokes in terms of his experience and um, just instrumental in helping us pull together some of this work that we've been putting, um, putting out. And then um, today, uh, we have a special guest, Melissa Cole. She was, uh, she's one of my colleagues and um, an, an amazing professor who teaches in pediatrics. And we get a chance to hear how she uses this in class and, and what she's seen as the effects compared to what she had in the past. Uh, so today is uh, Developmental Milestones and Pediatric Gate VR. She, I, I got to sit in on that class. I got to see her use the apps. Um, it's fun, it's powerful to see how we can leverage these resources to engage the students. So um, just so you know, Melissa has been at the university, man, it feels like actually for a few years now and is now working on her PhD. Um, she is an assistant professor at Azusa Pacific University and she has a specialty in early intervention and pediatrics. So Melissa, thanks for being here today. So whenever we build an app, this is actually like last week or the week before, just a week ago-ish. And one of the things we wanted to do, I, I said to Melissa way back when, when we were thinking about this app, was how do I, how do we, how, I asked her, how do you train students to recognize developmental milestones? And she said, well, we have these videos. We have videos scattered across the web and some videos of my own kids. And I try to use them to show as the baby develops. So I said, oh, well, that would be kind of a cool project. Why don't we bring in a baby and follow that baby for every month of his first year and see if we can capture all of that and organize it so everybody can have a clean, nicely filmed, organized resource. So we did it. Every month of the first year of this baby Blair's life, he came in with his mom and we filmed. Um, the other thing we wanted to see if we could solve was how do I look at variability in typical development? This is an ongoing project. We're still filming in the studio. And also what Melissa will show you is that we have different kids in, that, in this app so that we can show how different kids do different things and how certain kids who may be um, developing atypically may move. And we will continue to add to this library so that you can use it and leverage it into your classroom. The next question we were trying to solve was, how do I help students develop movement analysis skills? So this is Melissa talking about, hey, let's look at baby Blair. What do you see? Where's his arms? So how do we help the students see this, begin to wrap their head around how children develop and how they move? And how can we put this resource in an organized way into their pocket, into their laptops and their phones so that they can access these videos? They're not just locked away in some folder in my Google Drive. They're always available for the student to immerse themselves in the content. And then here, what you'll see is, how can I develop gait analysis in, the, in pediatric patients? So Melissa will also be able to show briefly how we use this app in the classroom to apply the knowledge they've learned in their gait analysis class and now apply it to the pediatric population. So a number of these gait VR, these, these patients have very common gait patterns related to different uh, problems that pediatric patients have. So we'll show you that in just a second. So actually I'm going to, um, I'm going to pause for a second and let Melissa uh, screen share for a bit. Melissa, why don't you share a little bit about perhaps 
how you've been using these apps in your class and maybe show, show the group a little bit about um, what you've been seeing and how you, you know, what you've been showing the students, how you use it. Yeah, of course, I'd be happy to. Thanks for having me, Mike. Yep, of course. So the way we typically introduce, or I introduce in my class is we go through the learn. So we go through the month by month. And as I'm going through those milestones and, and teaching, they have videos that they can pull up along the way or that I'll pull up on the screen and have. So as we're talking about, you know, all these different movements and changes from month one, from month two, we'll just pull up. All right, so let's see. How did it look different when we saw Blair from month one to month two? And they can start calling out the differences that they see initially before I even tell them what the difference was from month one from month two. Um, they're starting to see that. So we love that. They love this. This is great for them studying their milestones as well. The other thing I use quite often is like Mike said, I like to go through and do, sorry. I like to go through and do uh, the motor, uh, some movement analysis with them. So I'll take them through typically Blair, like this is what we're seeing. And we have a form that we fill out, like what is the trunk doing? What are they doing at initiation? What is all these different steps look like? But I don't want them to just know what Blair looks like. I want them to know what other kiddos look like too. So then we go to a lot of our cases and I'll say, okay, we're doing prone. so. Everybody pick, pick a baby in prone and assess that baby because all of these babies are going to look a little bit different. So what, is, what does it look like for them? So that's been really helpful for us just to have that uh, opportunity, like Mike said, that variability available for us to see in different kiddos. And as Mike said, our hope is to keep building this library so we can say, hey, these are a bunch of two-month-olds in prone. Can we see some differences between them? Because my students uh, tend to get stuck in like, this is two months. Well, yeah, that, that is typical two months, but what's the range? So I want them to see a, a range of what normal looks like. And that would be our big uses for that. Uh, Melissa, for, Melissa yeah. actually, let me jump in just for one second. <clears throat> so, so when you look at, so I'm gonna go back to the app here. And for those of you who don't already have the app, this app is available to all faculty you have full faculty access and full availability for you to use it anytime you like. So just so that you can see, one, we have clustered all the apps because there's so many now, you can search for it through this search bar. So if you're like, I'm in neuro, here's your neuro apps. I'm doing peds, peds has these two for now, I'll show you what's coming soon. So if you go back into the milestones, what I want you to see too, is that in each month, so if you look at supported sitting in month one, we ask the students, what do you see? How well are they holding their trunk up? And here are the observations. And here is what a typical development, some things that you should be keeping in mind. Now, very soon, all of these observations in a typical development will be hidden in a little drop down menu, meaning the answers will not be just available for students to look at. We think that now that we've played with this for a few years, we think that it's nice for these to be hidden first, have a discussion with the students, ask them what they see, and then the instructor can just click on the down arrow and then these answers come up. So that's, that's an update that's coming pretty soon. So as you can see, as you move from month to month, so I'm gonna move over to let's say month four, look at supported sitting here. So he's doing a little bit better. And so again, the observations, discussing with the students, this creates a really, really easy way for you to jump between months, for you to be looking at the same child, and then you can pick and choose what you wanna talk about. You always have the support of this content here so that you, the students can also go back and study this on their own. The other thing I didn't wanna miss a chance to share with you about was this cool sidebar. In this cool sidebar, you have an educator resource. And in the educator resource, you can copy page title with link. 
So if I go to, let's say a PowerPoint, so here's my milestones PowerPoint, I can add supported sitting. I'll probably make a note that this is month four. And then I can also from the app, copy thumbnail image. So when I go back here and drop that thumbnail image in, now I have the matching picture of that particular thing that I'm trying to show. And when I click on this, it can take me directly into the app, meaning every single one of your lab handouts or every single one of your PowerPoints can now be augmented with images and links to videos. So you can just click on anything because when you log in as a faculty member here, so when you go to physiou.health and you log in, it just remembers that I'm logged in. It's always open. That's the beauty of this resource. It's always there, any device. As long as you click remember me, it will just open up. So anytime you click on something in your lecture that is linked to PhysioU, it will automatically take you there and you can now open the video and play the video and talk about things. You can do that for pretty much anything in the PhysioU suite of apps. So I hope that that is also handy for you, that you can now augment your own resources with high quality video, knowing that these videos don't disappear off of YouTube every so often so that when you click on something, it's no longer there, or that you have to watch an ad or this and that. We think that the students deserve better, and this is a platform where you can, you can be assured that clinical specialists and videographers and programmers have spent a lot of time trying to figure out how do we make teaching more professional and how do we make teaching more efficient and, and, and provide the same resource for the students? So I want to show you that when you come back into the learn phase, oh, actually, let me just take a moment. Do you have, are there any comments or questions about that? Feel free to unmute yourself or type something in the chat. Any comments or questions about that? I put a comment in the chat to help you know, stimulate discussion. And I asked Melissa, is it good that she has these already done and she knows what videos are going to be kind of archived from the physio thing rather than going to YouTube? And you mentioned that, Mike, going to YouTube, finding something that works really great next thing, you know, next year it's gone. And then also, you know, the, the benefit of that, that as a teacher, you know, hey, this one kid, you know, Brent, you know, is really good at at &R demonstration. I can go to that video and show it real quick or something. I mean, so I think it's very helpful for the teachers, Melissa, if I'm, is that correct? Yeah. So I think that's a very valuable use of this tool. Yeah. I mean, think about the effort it takes in preparation for this class to organize all the video content that you need. And how do the students get access to this video content? Because learning is usually not a one, one shot thing, right? There's multiple exposures. Students have less anxiety when they know that this resource is available, available to them to pre-learn to learn during class and for them to follow up when they're out in the clinic. So that's one of the key values of this resource is it doesn't go on the shelf when the class ends. If we're in an orthopedic class and we're talking about something related to pediatrics, I can go back and open this app anytime that I want. So any other thoughts or comments? Mike, I have two um, questions. The yes. first, you said that the plan is to get rid of or, you know, hide the, the initial observations, yes. et cetera. Um, when is that going to happen? Because that is something that I've been kind of hoping would happen. Um, we've already done it in the database. Okay. We are, it's Great. actually available now. We're, we're just double checking that everything works. It can be, it can probably be ready within the next two weeks. Okay, great. Yeah. And then um, my other question is, uh, is there a plan to go kind of beyond the first year of milestones? So to, you know, move on to like running and, um, you know, stages of kicking, stages of throwing, um, you know, skipping, galloping, those kinds of activities as well. I'm going to direct that to the amazing Melissa Cole, because she is actively filming in the studio with patients. Um, what are your thoughts, Melissa? Yeah, we definitely want to get some uh, older milestones, not going month by month, obviously, as the older kids. But like you said, uh, progressions of running, throwing, all of those kinds of things. We're also working on some intervention as well. Great. Thank you. Yeah. 
And um, Samantha, do you mind me asking, um, and Melissa, you may already know this, just um, please excuse my ignorance. Um, this list of ages and tasks that you might want, is there an established place so that we can make sure we hit all the main things that you would want? Mm, I'm not exactly sure what you're asking. I guess, I guess, you know, um, you have these tasks, throwing, running, skipping. Um, is there a, a, a text or is there a resource that lists all of these key ages and key tasks that would help us make sure we captured what most faculty need? I mean, I use a variety of sources, but um, I mean, I generally think the Campbell text is um, probably the best Pete's text in PT. Okay. Um, Efkin has good lists of things though. So that might be another good resource to look at. Okay, awesome. James, could you make sure you, you got that? And I'm sure Melissa knows too. So yes, I think that's, that's a great thing for us to think about. You can imagine filming during the pandemic was really tough. Um, but as we are emerging from it, I think the availability of children to come into the studio is becoming greater and greater. And um, those are not difficult things to, to capture. So I think we're definitely going to put that on the list, hopefully over this summer. Other comments or thoughts, ideas? Okay. Please feel free to just jump in if you if you have a thought. Let me show you reflexes real quick. So we filmed all the common reflexes. Here's the stimulus, the response, the appearance and the integration and some potential atypical development. Um, so you again have a collection of things that you don't have to dig around for. They're all, all the common ones are here. When you go to observe, observe is essentially an opportunity to look at different children who have different ways of movement and who potentially have some type of atypical development. So for example, as we play this video, we can ask the students, just this is the drop down menu idea. What do you see? Here are the things that they see. What is the functional age? So we can have that discussion. Okay, this is the functional age. And then what is the actual age? Here's the diagnosis. And we can ask the students to develop some short term and long term goals. All of the answers technically are here to support the faculty. We usually tell the students that when we are going through this process of observation, which is why we've called it observe, the students are not at allowed to look at the answers until we're done doing the observations and having the discussions. These are just prompts. And so you have a number of these for different movements that you can use in your classroom now to have students kind of apply their knowledge related to typical development and then try to determine a functional age, um, make observations, things like that. So slowly we will add more children to this, but I think there's, there's plenty to start with. Any co comments or questions about that? All right, Melissa, why don't you um, share screen again and maybe take us through the standardized testing component and how you use it. Sounds good. Let me pull up. All right, so. <laughs> All right, so we have a couple um, case studies associated, and this is usually what I'll have them do once we've gone through. What does the AIMS look like? What does the bot, what does the DACI look like? And then they can practice them on their own, which is very helpful for them. Uh, assessing, I'm sorry, scoring tends to be one of the challenges 
for them. So we do some together in class and then they can work through these on their own. And it gives them, breaks it down into what, what they should be looking at at different, different points of the video. So it guides them to the actual questions that they need to be looking at or the positions, like the aims is just position wise. It guides them to, if they were interested in the instrument, like when they're in the clinic, they can get a link to the clinic and then scoring for them as well. And then if we will debrief afterwards, make sure everybody got the same things, maybe make sure that there are no questions with it, but it's a good opportunity, again, like Mike said, for that repetition. So currently uh, we have the Ames bot and DAC. We have another bot that we are gonna be adding and we have ooh, a, a Peabody as well that we have filmed and that we're getting ready to put on. Perfect, thank you. So I'm gonna take the screen share back for a second. So understandably, the Peabody and the Daisy, or, or a lot of these tools, let me go back to the app for a second here. A lot of these tools are um, proprietary. So what we've tried to do, so what you can see is under standardized testing right here, we have tried to sort out and aggregate the most common tools, uh, standardized tests, and you can sort it by diagnosis. So if you look at cerebral palsy, here are the common tests. Here is just, it, it's just an overview, right? So we don't, obviously we don't have this tool. Uh, faculty, I'm sure, achieve their goal in various different ways to get students to experience the tool, to try the tool out. But ultimately, we hope we can aggregate all the tools, allow you to have conversations about options. Here's the purpose, the diagnosis, the age group, some psychometrics. If you want more information, we direct you to SRA Lab, which always has the, the most updated information. We don't need to reinvent that wheel. And then you have a link to the instrument as well so that we can encourage students to go purchase what they're supposed to go purchase. And then from there, you can see under standardized testing, you can also sort all of this by age groups. So zero to 12 months, here's some of the common tests you would consider for that age group. None of these are the official tests. They're just, they show the exact same information, right? Here's just a sample page you can't really see what's on there, but you kind of recognize it because you want the students to be able to feel comfortable looking for these tools, being able to find the instrument. And, um, and then again, I think it, you, you can't replace the faculty in, the, in helping the students understand what these tools are for, how to apply them and what you glean from them. So that's the standardized testing component. And then again, in the case studies component, you have these, options to ask the students to maybe let's let's try to score this here's the things i want you to score let's watch this child it's only a small part of the test and then here is the key so again our hope is we we help to make the interactive classroom a little bit simpler to run by creating these little options let me just pause here for a second are there any other key one, key tests that we could create little samples of that you would find really useful for your classroom or is this sufficient? I'm just like to open this up to the group for a second. Any comments from the group? Any further thoughts from you, Melissa, or anybody else in the group? Do you actually have time to run more of these little ones? And based on the things we filmed also, perhaps any ideas of what we might wanna release? I mean, I think the Peabody will be a good one too, to add to that list that we have already filmed. So we just need to get that organized a little bit. Okay, good. 
Any thoughts from any of the other professors? I guess one other thing that I've done um, is I have a video of my daughter doing the Peabody when she was pretty little. And, um, you know, it is not standardized. Um, and it, so I, I do use that video in, you know, kind of having the students analyze where does standardization fall apart and, you know, like kind of a compare and contrast to like what should be happening versus what is happening, how does that invalidate your results and that kind of thing. Um, so I, I guess I would just say um, that's actually been a really good tool, I think, for students to, to kind of go through that and think about like the, the types of mistakes that we make in testing and then how important that is, particularly like in school-based settings um, where you're really, you know, trying to qualify students and that kind of thing. So um, that might be one thing to think about as well. That's great. Samantha, do you mind if at some point we reach out to you to discuss that a little bit further to kind of flush that idea out a little bit better? Because I'm trying to figure out what does that look like in this kind of format? Or what does that potentially look like in an interactive um, kind of e-module or simulation or something like that. I, I, it's floating in my mind. And then once it hit, I, my mind hits pediatrics, everything goes blank. So it, I, I always need to kind of float the idea and then flesh it out with a few specialists. So if you're, if you're okay with it, we'd love to reach out and just chat about it a little bit. Yeah, you bet. Awesome. Any other thoughts or ideas related to case studies? Okay, so let me show you then. That's the Developmental Milestones app. I want you to be able to see that we have collected all the months of development for the first year. We will work on adding kind of the older age groups and their movements. You also have the reflexes available at your fingertips. In the observe section, you have all these different children, various different children doing different tasks or different movements that you can use to create an interactive classroom. You can ask your students to do the analysis and then have a discussion about it. So that is, um, and then you can leverage the standardized testing as a way to talk about common tools and how you make the decision about what types of tools you make. And that, that can be a lead in to the actual application of some of these tools to videos you may have or videos that we've already filmed. So that's, that's one of the big pictures I wanted to show you. The other thing that I think is really cool is um, I got to see it last a couple weeks ago in class. So the students have learned basic gait analysis in, uh, in one of their earlier classes, their early clinical skills class. And now we're piggybacking on that knowledge and applying it to the pediatric population. And we are also teaching them to use a standardized tool. So let me take you to the PhysioU if I look under pediatrics, you will see pediatric gait VR. So in pediatric gait VR, this is done in partnership with the University of Idaho and actually was originally created by Dr. Edie Kendall. Um, so here we have, what I wanna show you here is some of the subjects in this assessment tool are real patients that with real pathology, captured in the motion capture lab. And Edie had, had recognized that some of the videos that she had of patients, eventually these patients grew up to become adults. And um, May, at that time, the parents had said, hey, it's totally fine. You can use these videos for education. But then these kids grew up and became adults. And so she thought, hey, maybe we should just capture these children in a motion capture lab and turn it into a video, a virtual reality experience. So our student goes in, types in their name, selects a patient so we can start with Sarah. And Sarah begins her movement, right? Her gait. Now here under history and instructions, I know this is a little bit small, so I'm gonna zoom in a little bit. Under the history, you will be able to see that Sarah is an eight year old girl with a diagnosis of right spastic hemiplegic cerebral palsy. So you're really bringing the patient into the context of this clinical environment 
but you're augmenting the clinical environment to make it simpler to do this somewhat complex task of gait analysis. So she is coming to you in your outpatient clinic today for a gait assessment and recommendations for orthoses. You decided to perform the EVGS, which is down here, the Edinburgh Visual Gait Score. This helps the student walk through the Edinburgh step-by-step. Step. If they don't know what they're looking for, initial contact and stance, there is a description. We got permission from the authors of this tool to add this in. So from here, the student can continue with grading. So here I see toe contact and I'm moving on. I can zoom out, I can zoom in using my arrow keys. Let me go back here, make this a little bit smaller. I can rotate around the patient using my arrow keys to catch a different view. Heel lift in stance, no heel contact. Maximum angle of dorsiflexion. So I'm gonna pause the patient here in stance. I'm gonna move her backwards a little bit right there. We can move her forward, stop it right there. And then I can apply my goniometer. And the students basically spent maybe 15, 20 minutes working together on going through the Edinburgh. When you are done, there is a key. So the students can see what they chose and what Edie chose as the expert. And then they can go back and look at the patient again and kind of figure out what they got right and what they got wrong. So you can see that you can also apply a posture grid you can move your visual angle, you can change your visual angle. So they work their way through Edinburgh Visual Gate Score, and eventually you can choose different patients. I'm gonna take that out here. This is a, let's see, he's a 12 year old struggling with some motor problems. We have, Sarah Kimberly, who has, let's see, variable diplegic cerebral palsy. Now think about this. All of this, one of these can be done in class as an interactive part of your classroom. Another one can be just assigned, guys. This weekend, I want you to go into Physio U, open your pediatric gate VR, and we want you to do Jennifer. So Jennifer has mild hypotonic diplegic cerebral palsy. Let them go through. It's asynchronous. It's exposure. It's multiple exposures. By the time they're done, they would have done the Edinburgh four times. They would have got feedback from an expert and they would have applied their gait analysis skills and begun to develop their pattern recognition related to these different types of patients. So any comments or thoughts about pediatric gait VR? And Melissa, did you have anything else you wanted to add in about what you, how you run this in class or things that you've seen the students take from this? Yeah, because there's so many uh, cerebral palsy cases, we use this during our cerebral palsy uh, module and have them use it in conjunction with case studies. So they're using this as part of their analysis and then they're moving on to uh, create treatment plans and things like that. Fantastic. Yeah, they've, they've really enjoyed this activity. That's great. Comments from the group, faculty, questions? Okay, so let me take us towards the finish line here. A few things in the works. We have the pediatric intervention. So um, 
the other thing I asked Melissa was, hey, what else do you teach in class where you often demonstrate things? And um, she said, oh, oftentimes we try to, I try to show examples of pediatric interventions. I'm like, oh, that's perfect. Why don't we start trying to film that and organize that? Now, how to organize it is another question. And so what I wanted to do is first off, ask faculty, what do you do in your classroom when you're talking about common interventions, common exercises? How do you teach that? Could I just open that up for a few minutes? We, we still have quite a bit of time. I'd love to hear from faculty. How do you teach that component? And what kind of resource would be useful for you to assist you in that? Any comments from any of the faculty? How do you teach interventions? How do you demonstrate it? How do the students learn it, apply it? Any thoughts? Is that like kind of the lab component, Mike, where they may have babies I in the lab? It, I think it's a lab component. Melissa, is, is that generally a lab component for you where you demo intervention techniques and then students try it out or? Yeah, we'll go through lots of different types of interventions with them. Um, like you said, some like therapeutic exercise, some handling. Uh, a lot of it is getting them to be a little bit more play-based in their intervention. They know what they wanna do. They just don't know how to do it well um, with a child to be motivating. Yeah. How much of it's therapeutic, therapist directed? How much of it's family education? Like do this with your little one, you know, your little kiddo you know, when you're not in therapy, make sure you do this or that or whatever. Is that, is that kind of a component of that intervention component of teaching? Yeah, we do a fair bit of both. And moving into my students have their practical exam next week that they have both. They have to show me an appropriate intervention for the case that we've given them. And then they have to teach me how they would teach a parent what the intervention would be and why, why it would be appropriate for their child. Any comments from the faculty group? about how you typically do this on the pediatric intervention side or any resources that you typically use for this? Yeah, yeah. do you do it, how you do it, and would this physio you thing be of help? Anybody? I don't know if you can hear me. Can you hear I assume. Me? Yep, we can uh, hear. Um, yeah, I, so um, when I teach pediatrics, I typically have had like a baby day where I get babies of different ages to come in. And um, most of the time I've never seen the, the kids before. So it's kind of a surprise. And I've, you know, had children come in that are very advanced in their skills. And then, and then sometimes uh, not so much. You end up with a surprise. And, and that's a good thing. I, I love seeing real babies, but the problem is, it, you know, it's difficult to uh, schedule. And the other thing is the students don't really get any hands-on experience. It's more of a demo. I really, um, I'm really excited about being able to use PhysioU just in, um, in the analysis uh, that the students can do in the cases you're presenting. So I'm, I'm excited about this prospect. I, I want to get signed up. That's great. You know, what that reminds me about, Sue, is I know, um, Melissa, we recently had a patient day, and particularly during the pandemic, doing patient days for both neuro class and peds class was just impossible. So it kind of dawned on me that there are probably things that we could film, things that you're already filming, Melissa, where there's a very clear impairment of sorts. We can ask students in an e-module whether we call it a simulation or something like that, to identify some of the common impairments and movement faults. We can then give them options of, uh, to, to perhaps type into an open text field, what, sub, what are some interventions that they might, that they might um, envision doing for a established impairment. And then we can actually show a video or have them select from a few options a video of that of that uh, treatment being done, 
So you could have this kind of asynchronous experience that's more formative than it is summative, but it allows for that, that kind of bringing in the patient into the, in, as a context builder. And I don't know, um, Sue, when you, when you are, bringing these babies in, are you primarily doing a quick eval and treatment on these various children to kind of give the students an idea of how to model after that? Yeah, because, you know, they're, they're volunteers, you know, and, and most of them are brought in as normal subjects. So what I'm doing is I'm, you know, working with the baby, putting them in different positions, demonstrating kind of the same skills that you have in your developmental videos. It's yeah. just that we've done that in person because I haven't had access to use those developmental videos. Yeah. You know, I'm not, I, I think using those videos may be a better use of time actually. But, but yes, to me, anything you can do having to do with real subjects that might be showing a particular type of delay, I mean, that's, that's something that's so valuable and it's, it's difficult to do, especially with the pandemic. We, we were trying to bring in real patients and do patient demos on them, but everything kind of crashed when the pandemic hit. Yeah. And I also think that these asynchronous kind of online mini games, they're fairly efficient, meaning mm -hmm. every student gets to go through the process, gets to put their thoughts down gets to learn at their own rate. And so I feel like many of these Sims that we've been building, they're not, they're not meant to be hard. They're really just meant to be a stepping stone from we've talked about typical development. Here's something that doesn't look quite right. Can you identify what that is? Exactly. Can you make a basic, basic decision about some potential intervention? And then let's show you a video of how that might look. Boom, it's a half step further in the right direction. And that can, I think that's also a very nice bridge to real patient day. I know our students, um, and Melissa, you can chime in on this. They are often like one of our labs is turned into a romper room full of kids, some running around like crazy, some are just, and there's groups of students trying to do what they've been taught, putting their hands on the patient or the subject or the baby and trying to facilitate certain things or, um, so I think of these asynchronous little e-modules as something that you, Sue, could assign on a weekend and say, please play through these three patients, kind of apply what you've learned, be creative about, and be creative about what you wrote, because what can happen, for example, let me just show you real quick, let me come out of this for a second, is in the end, when the students complete a little game. So we have a bunch of these little games. So like a range of motion game is a game built upon some patient story, right? Here's the patient story. Here's a course key that says, hey, by the way, this patient came in and he says, I can't reach overhead. So please apply your knowledge and tell us what range of motion would you like to assess? Oh, I wanna assess shoulder flexion. Okay, let's watch him. So you get to watch him move with a painful shoulder. Oh, you're right. Shoulder flexion is the problem. Let's see if you can apply your knowledge of where is your landmarks, right? What's the movement, the st stationary arm, movement arm, drag and drop. So there's all of these little games that we've created to help the student take a half step from, I just learned the skill in lab to, oh, here's a patient that I'm going to apply this knowledge on. And we ask the students, okay, please put the axis of rotation where is appropriate, the moving arm where it's appropriate, where the axis or the stationary arm. So they go through these different, different games. And at the end of the game, you can turn it in. So the students play, play these games, just like the pediatric ones they would play. And you will be able to eventually have them download a learning report that shows you how many times they played, what was their highest score? I usually give them points for the highest score. I'm happy that they're playing these things. And then you also, if they're open text fields, for example, you're asking them, please describe an intervention that would address this patient's inability to sit up. You will be able to see what they wrote. Or you can have them type in, how would you, what would you educate the parent to do as a home program you can see all of that text when they turn these little learning reports in. 
So I think from all the video we have, Melissa, we could easily build some short little games that would allow students then to apply some of their knowledge and we can just tease little things out of them and they can just enjoy applying their knowledge. So I think that's a really important half step for students is take ownership of what you've learned, apply it to a context rich environment and that leads to their ability to apply it in a clinical setting. Any thoughts about that, Sue? Does, does that sound useful? <laughs> that sounds wonderful, yes. Okay, awesome. Let me give you a quick sneak peek of what pediatric interventions is gonna look like. So the way we organize this is we, we basically tried to create large categories because there just isn't a master list of techniques. It's not like ortho. Here's seven special tests and seven manual therapy techniques. So we give these options of common, common issues you may see in patients. We are doing this from a multidisciplinary perspective, which is really cool. I'll share with you another thing that we'll be releasing soon. So here's the PT considerations. We're gonna look at core strength. We're gonna look at prone weight bearing as an option for interventions. And then this is not actually the right slide, sorry. And then here you have a video of a PT doing prone weight bearing with a baby with some instructions and they can hear the, the therapist on how they're cueing the child, how they're making play and making it fun. So then this can become just a, a kind of launching pad for you to apply your own experiences and your own, own knowledge. But that, that is one of our thoughts um, is just organizing some basic common interventions based on these key categories. So Melissa and I actually were curious from the faculty who are, who are willing to just share, does this way of organizing basic interventional strategies and techniques, does this work? Is there a better way that you can think of? This is just open to the whole faculty group here. I mean, to me, to me, your your categories look really good. You know, I, I really like being able to show the the differences in tone, um, especially with the addition of fluctuating tone, because I, I think that's something that um, doesn't always get discussed. Yeah. Um, so that that looks good to me. Okay. Anybody else? Thank you, Sue. Any things we should consider as we continue to move forward? I think that um, Melissa meets with an OT and they co-treat or they take turns treating different patients as they come in. And then we capture that and then we break it up into short little exercises that we can use as video examples. Um, those eventually also will probably be the fodder for making these little e-games. Um, any comments from the rest of the faculty group? about this. Okay, please know that we are in the video capture phase of this. We just bring in children um, over time and we have a list of different tasks and exercises and, and you know different techniques that we're trying to capture. So, if you ever have some idea that you're thinking of, please feel free to reach out to me at mike at physiou.com. Um, or you can always schedule an appointment with me. Um, James put that link into the chat. Are there any comments as, I, as we finish up here? Thoughts or comments? Example of what, Eamon? Eamon? If you wrote in the chat, can we see any example? If you want to unmute yourself or type it in the can we chat. See any example? Oh, Amon. Oh, okay. So Amon, you're asking of PT treatment. Yeah. That I mean, that's what we're doing. We're filming PT treatment of children who have different, you know, different developmental issues um, and showing how you can integrate play to get a child to do a particular task. So, and Rachel says here, maybe an additional intervention category would be impaired motor planning unless it falls under one of those already listed. Great, 
we will we will add that in. Perfect, Rachel. Thank you. Any other comments? Now, this is just kind of the open idea time. So uh, next week, we are talking about the Gate app, which is really, it's an amazing app. Um, and then I will reshare about Pediatric Gate VR. But for those who teach Gate, if you're looking for that, uh, please feel free to join us next week. Um, any other thoughts? Um, thank you, Travis. Thank you for your comments. Yeah, we hope that this makes it easy for you. When I walk into class, Physio U is always up on my screen because the more the faculty leverage it and use it in the classroom, the more the students feel comfortable using it as well. That's what a resource really should be. It shouldn't be like, I'm gonna force you to read this. And when you're done reading it, you're gonna put it away and never use it again. We hope that the more you use this, the more they will learn to use it when they're seeing pediatric patients in the clinic. So it's really a, a tool that crosses the boundaries of the curriculum. I think, Travis, I mean, that's a great comment. And, and Fizu, you, I think it makes, it, it's work smart, not hard. And I, I think faculty are asked to do more and more with less time, you know, in our, in our curriculum. And, and the best thing is that the students will have this resource when they go out in the clinic and say, oh, crap, I forgot what month six is supposed to look like. Boom, pull it out, look yeah. at it real quick. So I think it's easier. It's better for the student learning, too. You know, it's so I call it sticky knowledge. It sticks because they can see it more. And the more that you integrate it into the curriculum, that's easier for them to go back and find it on the PhysioU app, not only just in pediatrics, but the ortho guys and neuro folks, the acute care folks. I think it'd be very helpful for them. You know, the students get more familiar with the with the tool and they're that much more quicker to uh, reference it and find the information they need while they're in the clinic and then ultimately studying for state boards. You know, they I think this is a kind of a, a, a tool for the initial studying for their state exams. Yes. Any other comments from any of the pediatric faculty? Things that you're like, ooh, I do this and it works really well. We would love to hear anything that you've done that you think really helps your classroom. And that always helps me to think about what other things we can build that will help, um, help faculty worldwide to teach better. Any other comments or thoughts from the group? So Amon says, last question. Uh, when this app will be available on PhysioU. Actually, uh, the interventions app, I think it will probably take us the rest of the summer, if not the rest of the year, to capture the content we need. And there's still a lot of programming and editing to do. Um, usually, we release apps in summer and spring. So there's, a, there's kind of a summer release and a, um, let me think about this. I think summer release and a spring release. So it, there's a lot of cost and effort that goes into this. For faculty, just so you know, all faculty have access to this for free. The students subscribe to this on a yearly basis. That supports us paying patients, paying for the studio, paying for programmers. We're constantly generating new content and listening to things that you need. So um, many schools, some schools will just purchase it for their students because they're like, hey, we're using it from orthopedics to neuro, pediatrics, cardiopulmonary, it covers everything. So the $99 a year is nothing. We, it's great, that's the cheapest thing we can find. Some, some faculty will just require it and they'll basically put a link to in their class. They'll say, hey, you're gonna use this app. If you go to the website here, you will, the students just go to, they put a link here and the students can pay for it it's either $99 a year, or if you use three years, it's $219. That's 36 months. That's like eight bucks a month, right? Or something like that. I, I didn't do the math, but the, the cost is about the cost of a venti matcha frappe whatever from Starbucks. So we are very sensitive to this idea that students have very high debt, but we believe, we believe that these apps can deeply improve learning across the curriculum. And they're all built by specialists, um, you know, specialists. So I think, I hope what, what you see is we, James, myself, Melissa, we're all faculty in the trenches teaching. 
thinking about how do we make learning better and yet not not increasing the debt load. Like in our program, we've slowly begun to eliminate certain textbooks. We don't need a textbook to teach them how to read range of motion MMT. Students wanna watch a video of how to do it and then they've got it. So there are certain textbooks that we eliminate. One textbook that you eliminate covers the entire app for a year. Think about how many different classes that you can teach when you are using right fundamental skills, acute care, neuro, peds, musculoskeletal rehab, the orthopedic side. I mean, a lot of what you need is here and we are committed to continuing, continuing to add apps and make this a more powerful resource for students. All these e-learning applications, these simulations, they're such powerful learning tools. Um, and just so you know, we have created a document that maps every app to every CAPD standard because we are completely invested in revolutionizing how we teach, meeting the students of this generation where they wanna learn. So any other thoughts or comments, any questions? See, Travis mentioned, I was just thinking about reminding my students as they go into clinicals. Yes, we find that the students come back and they're like, man, I'm so glad that you showed me how to use the app. Because when I was in clinic, I couldn't remember some of the tests I need to do or some of the treatments I need to do for this person who has a knee meniscal injury. It's all in the app, the treatment, the therapeutic exercise, the prevalence. Um, so again, I think the power of the app is, we guys, remember as you're going out into the clinic, the same apps you learned within class, they're in your pocket. So don't forget to leverage these resources because how much more powerful that resource becomes when they're in the clinical context and they have these supportive resources that they're familiar with, that they use to create their knowledge base. Mike Travis just put that in the chat that he's 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 going to remind his students like, hey, don't forget to utilize that when you go into your clinicals. And I think that just uh, it just gives more value to the use of the app for them. It's not just a learn and burn and, and never pick it up again. It's right. It's there in the pocket all day long while they're in the clinic. Yeah, absolutely. So thank you guys. Thank you everybody for joining us uh, today. I'm very excited um, that Melissa was able to be here. Thank you, Melissa, for sharing that and also for your continued work. Um, James and I, are, uh, that's the end of the webinar. If anybody has any thoughts or questions, please feel free. James and I just hang out here for a few minutes. If you have any comments, ideas, um, please feel free to just stay on and unmute yourself. Um, great to see, is this Hua, Hua Kyung Shin? Great to see you here joining us. What program are you from? Oh, you're muted. You're muted. Uh, I'm Korean. I'm teaching in pediatric and RM and MMT and physical agent. I usually your I usually use your program. It is a very excellent program. Wonderful. Well, thank and you. Thank you. This is great. We're glad to be supporting education everywhere. So, yeah, yeah because um, much program you need. So I uh, I'm studying the program with teaching. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Fantastic. Oh, did you say you're starting a program or yeah, yeah. a new uh, program? After, yes. After after study program. I teach my student. Yes, yes, that's excellent. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. I, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm poor English. Speaker. No, it's great. It's great. <laughs> yes. In fact, I'm from Singapore. And so, yeah, um, yeah it's, it's great to, to hear that you, you and your students are utilizing it. And um, I hope you're also in the range of motion MMT and the physical agents, you saw that we have all these little e-games Yes. E-modules, those are super yeah. useful for helping yeah. the students apply their knowledge. I consider uh, the next semester, uh, I, can use, I can use the uh, student programs. 
Yes. Thank you. Yeah, yeah you're welcome. Thank you for joining us today. Uh, Any other comments from anybody? Thank you, Lewis, for your kind words. Yes, of course. And Rebecca as well. And Samantha, you mentioned here management examples for CMT, plagiocephaly, toe walking, scoliosis, other more orthopedic diagnoses as well. Yep, got it. I will make a note of that. Um, let me, I'm going to copy that. Melissa, did you hear that just, just so that we have that floating in our mind? Yeah, we actually have the footage too. Remember, we were going to make the, um, the e game, the learning module for torticollis. So yeah. we have that film and we're just going to yeah. put that. There. Yeah. So I think over time, if there's these common conditions that we can make little e games for, that would be very powerful as ways for students to apply, take that next half step. All right, everybody, it's 10 o'clock. I hope you have a wonderful weekend. Please stay in touch. Feel free at any time to reach out to me. Just book a meeting with me through that link. Happy to connect with you anytime. Yeah. Kwa Kyung would love to connect with you and any of your faculty anytime. Yeah, thank you. Mikey, I, um, I put the, uh, the link to how to contact you again at the okay. end of the, it was up there again, a second time. And can you stay on and yeah. you and I must have a sidebar and I don't yeah. care if other people stay on. It's just, yeah. I'm going to go over. Did you see the email I just sent you? Yes, I think so. I Thank you, everybody. Yeah. Okay. Hey, real quick, Mike, oh, I do have, I'm sorry. I, I kind of started in on the slice, but uh, so we just started using um, PhysioU this year uh, yeah. with our students and uh, just trying to figure out how to incorporate it and how to put it through our learning management system, the links and everything. We bring it up several times during, during the, uh, the program or class. Um, but is there, um, is there a resource that I, I teach in a, I'm a program director for a PTA program. Sure. And, uh, and so, you know, some of this stuff, you know, like the evaluation part is important and, and honestly, um, it's part of our boards as well, understanding and how all this happens and works. But, but as we go through our curriculum, and this summer I want to I want to integrate it more. Um, and I see something here being popped up with the educator resource there, but uh, um, a, a guide of how to how to kind of implement it even more efficiently. Yeah, uh, kind of hit and miss this year. So. so so one way to do it is I regularly join a faculty meeting, like an one hour meeting, and I kind of give an overview of what apps are there and give a general idea of the easiest ways to apply this in your classroom. So like, here's how you add videos for any class, cardiopalm, physical agents, taping, whatever. I teach everybody how to do that. There are these five minute self-guided app demos. These basically cover each cluster. So if you're like, oh, I teach ortho. Oh, great. Okay. Well then here are, there's me giving a five minute ish tour of each of these apps and how you would use it in the classroom. So these are directed strictly for faculty. Okay. Okay. So there's this resource here. If you, again, if you go to educator faculty resources, there's that five minute self-guided app demo. And almost in every one of those demos, I talk about Here's how you add videos to your lectures. Here's how you add videos to your, like you don't, you don't get to add necessarily the raw MP4 because then all of that would just disappear into the interwebs. But what you get is you could take a screenshot easily and have a hyperlink title so that anytime you click on it, it just opens up on your screen because you're already logged in as a faculty member. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So there's that I think would be very helpful for your faculty that if they go here to the educator faculty resources and you direct them to this page, which is the faculty page, they can find the cluster of apps that they're interested in because of their teaching specialty. And then when they watch those short little videos like here in neuro, your instructors will love that every single neuro exam that needs to be taught is already pre-filmed so that students can actually watch it. Like they can study this even before they come to class. Lots of our students mm -hmm. watch these videos before coming to class. Because okay. we, we really think, you know, if you think about a PTA program, you have to teach almost the same amount of stuff in like half the time. Mm -hmm. And so 
to be able to create opportunities for multiple exposures, right? Before class, here's your habit, guys. Before class, you have your lab handouts that have links to all the techniques you're going to learn. Please sit at lunch before lab and watch those techniques once. It will help you when we get to lab because it will be already, there will be a soft scaffold in their brain. So that would be my main suggestion is one, either invite me to a faculty meeting and I can do an overview mm. or two, invite your faculty to say, hey, our students are gonna have this. This app is gonna make your life so much easier and standardize the practice. That's another thing that we think is really valuable is John, Joe and Jim, all three of us are not gonna teach a PNF technique different or not gonna teach a timed up and go test different because we're all standardizing to the app. Yeah, yeah. you know. I think well, Mike, and, that, and, I think Travis, I mean, two ways that, to, to like, how do you eat a whale one bite at a time? One is those five minute things for in your class, how best to use the app and stuff like that. And that's something that, you know, you can do that five minute thing, but also call Mike and get an appointment with him to have him, you know, detail how to really make that work for you. But also I think the big benefit is how at a faculty meeting, if, if you get Mike to attend one of those and then in service whole faculty. So that way, you know, we're all talking about muscle testing the same way. We're all talking about range of motion measurement the same way. And there's variations, obviously. And that's what you can also include. But I think that the inter-class within you and then also inter-program or curriculum to make sure that's where, and that's going to be, and the, and the students go, ah, man, that's great because all my teachers are, are speaking the same, you know, language. Granted, there's variation. I know that. But, but really, I think that's where you get the biggest bang for your buck and almost like a the students would just, I think, find that there's very cohesive curriculum that you guys are all involved in. And uh, it just makes smart, efficient teaching. And then Mike has tips in terms of pre-reading and, and pre-exposure and multiple exposures for the, for the permanent learning for the students who have to learn a whole bunch in a very short period of time, especially yeah, for the well, PTA, PTA programs. And, yeah. And the PTA, you know, you kind of, I mean, we're, we're teaching everything with two of us. Um, teaching and mm -hmm. and uh, um, and there's 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 no way you can be an expert at at everything. I mean, and it and it, and it's challenging. And and the time that we have that we can allow on different areas is just not like I don't, I don't know how much time you spend on pediatrics necessarily in a PT um, program, but for for a PTA, we're talking well, our program, you know, maybe about three weeks you know, um, so a lot to cover. Melissa, Melissa has a half semester, which is eight weeks, uh, twice a week, I believe. Yeah. I don't know, Melissa, if you're still here, is that right? Yeah, we get them three times a week for eight weeks. Yeah, so yeah. that's a lot of content. Yeah. Yeah, you PTA yeah. folks, you guys are magicians. I don't know how you get it done. Yeah. <laughs> I've, I've, I've met them, yeah. Where do you teach, Travis? I'm at, uh, in Kansas, Hutchinson Community College. Okay, great. You know, can, uh, Travis, the other thing I was going to show you here is if you go to faculty resources, and this will be also useful for uh, several of you who teach these different classes. If you go here, right, so this is the faculty resources page. Under teaching content, there are, for classes that are very predictable, we have created lab handouts. So for example, for your range of motion MMT class, every lab handout that for shoulder, here is all the palpation that they need to find landmarks. So this they do on their own. You don't even have to use class time if you don't want for that. Mm -hmm. All of these are linked to videos, right? So they click on it. It opens up in their physio U. They watch Dan, my co-instructor, co demonstrating how to palpate for the coracoid process. So they learn all of that on their own. And then when you go deeper into the lab handout, you're like, guys, before you come to shoulder lab this week, you need to have palpated all of these structures on a partner or on your friend or on yourself. When you're done with that, I need you to watch. So I'm going to take you down to the range of motion MMT side. We are going to be doing range of motion MMT this week. So here is all of your instructions for internal rotation, external rotation, abduction. These are the matching instructions from the app with the landmarks, with the normal ranges linked to the video. They come to lab prepared. Yeah. 
We do the same exactly. thing in ortho. We do the same thing in neuro because now you have this whole library that you can leverage for each one of your instructors. It creates a pattern of learning that I believe is much more effective than the show and go. You know, it's like, you have no idea what I'm going to show you. You're going to get to watch it once. And then now everybody go practice and good luck. <laughs> now it's like, actually, you know exactly what I'm going to show you because you watched it before you came in. And then- and it- and the students, dem- yeah, the go students ahead. in the lab are like, it's only the first five people in the front row watching you first demonstrate it to get the good view. The rest of them are trying to look around each other and, and they're mm-hmm. taking notes. You don't have to do that. So by the time you get to lab, you go, okay, now I want a, a very large patient, you know, student patient and a very small physical therapist, you know, practicing. And let's see the challenges you have for being a small person trying to muscle test a big person, you know. So you get into that higher level thinking already because they've already done it, you know, and stuff like that. And I tell you, uh, uh, if the person doesn't take the time to kind of pre-learn or whatever, it kind of exposes themselves in lab and they're almost embarrassed. It's like, oh, I'm not going to do that. I'm going to make sure I'm ready next time. Yeah. Yeah. It's kind of a cohort effect. Yeah. Well, and one of the things that we've done is we've kind of gone to more of a hybrid approach where um, because of COVID um, and the, the standard and the uh, social distancing and all that, we, we've kind con- we've gone to, all of our lectures are online, all, you know, a lot of things that are online and then they come to class and it's more lab, um, the motor know, skills, uh, yeah. the motor skill kind of stuff. And so being able to add those into our lectures and actually link those in our online lectures would be a, a great place that, that they would, they would, it would make our lectures a little bit more, <laughs> I don't know about entertaining, but a little bit more effective, I guess. Yeah. More yeah. engaging for sure. Efficient learning. Yeah. Smart learning. Yeah. Yeah. And then, you know, what we do is at the end of that week, let's say it's ultrasound week, the students have an assignment. Basically we say at the end of ultrasound week, your job is to do the ultrasound SIM. So Mm -hmm. I open the SIM. I know what's in the SIM because faculty members can see the key. You get to play through the whole thing. So you know what you're, what kind of present you're about to open in the classroom. Like, I don't like using things that I don't know what's in there, right? You don't want to have to deal with all the consequences of whatever's <laughs> yeah. in there. So here's- You don't, don't want to see it for the first time in front of your students and go, let me figure that out too. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So That's all, always fun. <laughs> all the answers are here. And you basically copy and paste, copy page title with link. You put that into your lab handout or your, I mean, this is just an example, but you can basically say, all right, I'm- I'm going to copy and paste this into your, into your LMS. Everybody needs to do this over the weekend. And then please turn it in that learning history thing that I showed you, they just Mm -hmm. submit it and they get points. And what just happened is they got to watch a patient. They learned a little bit about the patient and they applied their Mm -hmm. knowledge in, in, in a clinically rich environment. Um, So there are many different, little things that you can see. I mean, you can tell that we're all educators pushing the envelope, understanding why is it so hard to learn new skills because there's too many of it and there's too little exposure to it. It's like a show and go. So we already knew that that didn't work well. The second thing we're trying to solve is why can't students know, how come they don't know how to apply any of their knowledge? Well, because we just did a show and go. There wasn't enough opportunity for them to unpack this knowledge. Yeah, yeah. So now we've created all of these opportunities that are asynchronous because you never have enough time in class. Now they can play as many times as they want. They love this stuff. They want to be, they want to be in a clinical situation and apply their knowledge. It validates the work that you are putting in as an instructor and the work that they're putting in to to really understand this stuff. You know. Yeah. Good luck to you, Travis. I mean, you're 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 fighting.